You may be seated. Well, good evening to everybody. How are y'all doing this evening? Hallelujah. Blessed and highly favored. Amen. Amen. Well, we're glad to see some of you back that was gone last week to the Grace Conference. Hallelujah. Amen. We're not going to say that we're mad at you. <laughs> but we missed you, but we're glad that you made it back to us safely. Amen. 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 As you can see, I'm here by myself tonight by myself. My wife is out of town. <laughs> uh, but she's watching. Amen. Amen. She said she's going to be watching. So, hello. I know she's watching. Amen. Amen. Y'all ready for the word tonight? Amen. All right. Let's get into it. Amen. Amen. Tonight we want to talk about, I'm going to talk from the subject of the consequence, the consequence of incorrect believing. That has been really being stirring on my heart um, for the last couple of weeks, I would say. Um, I, sometimes I like to use the word amazing because to me it is amazing, maybe not to you, how God began to speak to me about different things and, and maybe he, you can relate to that, how he directs you and, and there was a part in the teaching, we've been in a, a lot of teaching from our pastors about grace and about our righteousness, who we are in Christ Jesus. Excellent teaching with that information. Amen. Would you agree? Amen. How we're made righteous to what Jesus did. And so we're excited about that. And also we've been teaching about walking in peace, walking in the divine peace that God has provided for us. But I remember not too very long ago, God began to challenge me. And I was in, we was in service and we was listening to a teaching that pastor was doing about righteousness. And God challenged me by asking me this question. And he said, do you really believe that? And I said, you know where, you know the, the, the normal answer would be, well, yeah, Lord, I mean, I believe it. But I'm smart enough to know that if he asked that question, <laughs> he meant something by that. And so I began to, I, I said, yeah, I believe that. But then I'm like, well, why, why, would, why, Lord, why would you have that question? And I'm like, okay, I, there's something I need to think about here. And so I began to dilate my thoughts and, and what was being taught and what I was receiving and was I really receiving it, first of all. And then I said, God, I said, I think I, I really do believe it. And yet again, do you really believe that? Because there are so many times in church that we find that people go to church just to be going to church. Not necessarily because they really want to hear what the word of God says to change their life. But their agenda is, hey, I went to church today. I did what I was supposed to do. But there's a life change. There's a purpose. There's a reason why God wants us to understand and believe what his word is saying. Because I found that if we're not believing, really believing, what his word is, is saying, we're missing out on so much of God's best. Only because we, from tradition, we were, our automatic response is, oh yes, praise God, I believe. And now, every time I hear something, or I hear a scripture, I ponder on, I say, okay now, do you believe that? Because this is God speaking to us, do you believe that? And so sometimes I'm, I think, well, you know, Lord, that, that, that I'm understanding that and I'm having to process that. So maybe I don't believe it totally, but I know it from your word. So I'm going to accept it. That's what it is true. Well, I have to get past accepting it. We have to get past just reading from the scripture, but we've got to get it down on the inside of us to the point. That no matter what we may be faced with in life, our response should be, Lord, I trust you. Amen. And when you really, really trust him and believe him with every fiber of your being, you're at complete peace. Amen. You're not moved. I remember seeing a cartoon, and I, I've been trying to figure out where I saw that cartoon from, but I saw it somewhere online, but it was, it was a picture of someone standing on, you know, on some dirt, and everything, all the dirt around them was crumbling, but they were standing still, and they were looking unmoved, and I began to think, Lord, that's called trust, 
That's called faith because they're not moved about by all everything else what's going on around them. They're not moved that the earth is falling, that it's coming from around them. They're trusting in you. And that's the way God expects us to be when situations happen around us. We're not moved by that. Yes, I see that part is happening. And yes, it's there, but I'm not moved because why? I trust God. My belief is that God is. Your grace has already provided everything that I need that pertains to life and godliness. So I'm taken care of. Everything is well with me. So another thing, well, my wife and I, before she left, we began to talk about, you know, by believing and trusting. And we talked about various churches and old churches that we used to go to or some of them not too very long ago that we may have visited. And we were talking about the understanding that people have about the word of God. And she was saying how, you know, there's one particular church she talked about. She said, they know about the Holy Spirit. They have to understand that, you know, it's, it's a, a, a religious, a, um, a Baptist church, and they know about the Holy Spirit, but they choose still not to believe because they say, well, my grandfather didn't believe in nothing, that kind of stuff, so I'm not going to believe it either. Well, see, what a statement to make. When the word of God says what you should have, but you choose not to believe because of what somebody else didn't teach or what they didn't believe. How many other people do we find today that are, have misunderstanding and, 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 and incorrect beliefs because of what somebody else thought about the matter is? I was reading uh, a survey that, that I saw online and they were talking about that the survey was done recently, about 3,000 people did this survey. And they were talking about, and this, this survey was done with believers. And they were saying that they find it ironic that how so many people, believers in that 3,000 have made the choice, instead of trusting the word, trusting the word of God, to come up with, with their own thoughts and traditions about what they think the word of God is really saying. Not reading the word for themselves, but what they think, what kind of world are we living in now that people are coming up with their own intellect to what they think the word of God should really be saying? And that's what it means. And therefore, when they do that, they go out and tell other people what their feelings are. Now, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. Familiar scripture. It talks about trusting in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all of your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. It begins by saying trust in the Lord with all your heart, your, all your being, all your mind. Lord, I trust you. And then he says lean not to your own understanding. Right here we see it, trust in the Lord. With all your heart, lean not into your own understanding. Not your own understanding. Not what you think. I can't, I can't go by what I think because my mind, you know, can, can, can think something and that may be far from what God was saying. Because when I first heard about how much God loved me, it was difficult for me to receive that because I knew I had done things wrong. So it was hard in my understanding. I saw that he loved me, but I said, but he can't really love me because of what I did. And what was happening to me? I was going back to my old way of thinking, trying to stay there and not accepting what the word of God says, that God is a God of love. And there's no hate within him. That there's nothing that I could ever do to cause him not to ever love me. There was a, I remember also growing up in, in, in church, there was a guy that was their older guy, and I may have told this story before, but I still get intrigued by it because he's memorized the whole Bible. And as teens, we would have the, the, the Bible called Bible Bucks, and someone would call out a scripture, and the teen will try to find the scripture in the Bible before he quotes it. And that was the task. And there was times that 
He knew what the scripture was, and he'll just start to laugh, and we knew what that meant because that means he already knows what I'm about to, what I'm trying to find. I'm still thumbing through my Bible trying to find the page, but before I can get to it, he just starts spilling out what the scripture says. And he was always be right. And that's intriguing, true enough. But my thought went to, it's not just enough to memorize the Bible. The key thing is, did he believe what the word of God said? Because we could be amazed at people's memory. The Bible says even the devil knows what the word of God says, but you see he's still doing what he's doing. So it's not enough just to memorize the scripture, to be able to quote it. We've got to know this thing to the point to it's in our very being, our core, that no matter what comes up, God, your word says, I got that you got this and that all is well with me. I love to say all is well with me because I have to remind myself all is well. All is well with me. All is well with me because I, re what? I refuse to say something negative. I don't care what it looks like. I still choose to believe all is well with me. Now, as we go through this teaching tonight, I knew that I was supposed to challenge you to check your believing. So from this day forward, I want to challenge you that when you hear something, you read scriptures, and, and, you, and you're saying, I believe it, check yourself to see, do you really believe that? Because let's say, well, you know what? Well, I may not believe it the first time that I say it, but that's okay. But the more that you keep saying that particular scripture and meditating on that, that particular scripture, it comes a part of you and something changes on the inside of us to the point that I'm not moved anymore. I got it. And the way that you know that you got it is this. What's your response when situations happen? What's your first response? Is it to be stressed out about it? Is it to become fearful about it? Or do we just settle down and say, he got it? You know, faith is a powerful motivator behind everything that we do. Our belief ultimately influences our actions. However, if we want to succeed, we must know what to believe. When everything we expect or hope for in the natural realm fails us, we can confidently put our hope on God's promises. What does God say about that situation? I remember some years ago, but I guess it's been about 15 years ago, I fell and I, and I, I, I fractured my ankle. I fell off, off, a, off a ladder. And it, it was messed up pretty bad is what they were telling me. And they, I had to go to a specialist and the one that they referred me to, he instantly went into this thing about, oh, yeah, you're going to need a rod in that. You're going to need some pins in that. And you're not going to be able to move that leg and that ankle. You've got to freeze that. And I'm, I'm freaking out because I'm like, oh, God, I mean, all, I, mean I know it's bad, but I mean, I, I have to freeze it? I, I can't walk on it? And I'm like, and I said, well, God, I said, it got to be something better. And so we felt like we shouldn't take his opinion. I chose to say, okay, we're going to go get a second opinion. And God directed us to another person. And, and we went to see that doctor. And we showed him the results. And he said, well, no, you don't, you don't need surgery. He said, who told you you need surgery? I said, well, you know, this doctor told me I need pins and that. And he said, no. He said, we're going to put a boot on that. And we're going to wrap it up. And you're going to do some exercises. He said, and your ankle is going to be okay. And today my ankle is good. But I think back to what if I would have accepted what he, the first doctor said and had the surgery, all because of what he thought. God had a better plan. So sometimes we need to learn how to listen to the Holy Spirit. Even when you don't know you're being led by him, listen to that nudging to say, don't do that one. Don't go there. Don't accept that. Go somewhere else. Move on. Because there's a plan for that situation.
And today, I am so grateful. And I often think about where I would be if my ankle, if, if I would have had that surgery back at that time. Because, you know, normally if it's a doctor to tell you that, you would think they know what they're talking about. You would think that they have all the college behind them and they, they all have all this experience. But you've heard me say this before, you know, people can be sincere and be sincerely wrong. But they could be sincere. They could be sincerely wrong. I'm not knocking it because that's his opinion. And it was my choice to accept his opinion or get someone else's opinion before I decide what I want to do. So I thank God that he directed me. We have to learn, we have to get the right information the first time before you just accept something as being, you know, as being true. Now, we're going to look at a scripture in, in Psalms 51. Because we're going to look at a contrast of incorrect believing. In Psalms 51, look at verse 7 in the NLT verse, the New Living Version, New Living Translation. Now, of course, this is in Psalm, it's under the law. Verse 7 begins, it says, purge me from my sin. Now, this is, this particular scripture is dealing with the, the story of David and Bathsheba. We are familiar with that story. How, you know, David should have been out on the field in the, in the battle, but yet he's at home watching someone else. Not being where he's supposed to be. Then he ends up, and the woman was married to Uriah, and he had Uriah killed, and then they slept together. But, you know, he was still in the wrong place. But let's, verse 7 says, purge me with hyssop. Is this in the, in the New Living Translation? Oh, Y'all don't have that? Okay, I'll read it from my paper. Purge me from my sins, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Oh, give me back my joy again. You have broken me. Let me rejoice. Don't keep looking at my sins. Remove the stains of my guilt. This is David talking to, to, to God. And he's saying, Lord, you know, forgive me. Help me. I messed up. Verse 10 says, he says, create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. Then I will teach your ways to rebels and they will return to you. Forgive me for shedding blood, O oh God, who saves. Then I will just, I will joyfully sing of your forgiveness. Unseal my lips, verse 18 says, O oh Lord, that my mouth may praise you. Now this sounds like a really good spiritual thing for him to say because he messed up. But remember, this is a part of the Old Testament under the law, and we're no longer under the law. So far as New Testament believers, for us to accept this, and when we mess up, that we go to God and we say, Lord, don't keep looking at my sins. That's a slap in God's face because as the new covenant, he's already took care of our sins. So if we're still stuck in the old law, up under the law and not the law of grace in the New Testament, we have incorrect believing going on. If I feel like I didn't say, God, yes, I messed up and I feel guilty. So, Lord, you know, keep your, keep your, don't keep your eyes on my sin. Remove the stains of my guilt. Don't banish from me. He clearly says he'll never leave us nor forsake us. So we can't keep going back under the law and mixing law and grace. We have to have correct believing. It's important that we got to get it straight. To believe that today is why we cannot walk in the freedom of his love. Because we're stuck up under the law. There's got to be more to what God is saying. He can't just love me but because I, I messed up. Well, listen, you forgot that we have an enemy who doesn't play fair. And his job is to keep you from believing the word of God. And all he does is continue to bring those thoughts back and forth to remind you of what you did in your past or how you messed up or what you did last night. But we have to learn to say, God, I thank you that you forgive me, that you love me. All is well with me. 
So I may have messed up, but I'm right, but you won't hold that against me. I receive your love right now in Jesus' name. And keep moving. How many people can't get past that? How many people do you know that are on medication and stuff because they can't understand that God loves them because of what they may have done? God says, I'll never remember your sins. I'll throw them as far as the east is from the west. They'll never meet again. That's a good thing for some people. Because that God doesn't remember our sins. I thank God that he doesn't remember my mess ups. That he's not going to hold them against me. But what if I mess up tomorrow? He still forgives you of what you've done. His love still prevails. Now, Hebrews 10, 14 says, And I will be merciful unto them in their wrongdoings, and I will remember their sins no more. We're going to go now to some spiritual, some spiritual examples, some scriptural examples of believing. Because in the Bible, you know, that, that I love in Romans chapter 4, Verse 18, this is the, the book of Ab about Abraham believing God. When God said, Abraham, you're going to be the father of many nations. I like the way Abraham's response is. What did he do? Romans chapter 4, verse 18. He was an example of someone who chose to believe God, even in the face of adversity circumstances. When God promised Abraham that he and Sarah would have a son, it appeared impossible. Are you there? Romans, okay, there you go, right there. Romans 18, who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations. According to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. Verse 19, and being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body, now dead. When he was about 100 years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. Verse 20. He staggered not at the promises of God through unbelief, but was strong in his faith, giving glory to God. Verse 21. And being fully persuaded, that what he had promised, who promised it to him? God had promised him. He said, because what God promised him, he said he was able also to perform it. He chose not to look at his body. He chose not to be moved at what was going on with Sarah. He knew what age he was at. But he said, because, but because God said it, I believe it. And I'm going to accept that as a fact. So what things in your life that God has promised you? Based on the scripture, we get a scripture on it, we hold to that scripture, and we're not moved by it. We, I, I remember last week when Brother Michael was over here and he was teaching, and he did a very good job on his teaching. And he was talking about how, God, how he's been listening to the word of grace, and, and, and God had him to repeat and told him from now on, I want you to work up, wake up at certain hours and certain times of the day and say to yourself that I'm the righteousness of Christ. Why was he doing that? Because see, sometimes when you hear it the first couple of times, you might not really believe that you're the righteousness of Christ. But the more that you say it, the more that you repeat it, the more that you meditate upon it, I'm the righteousness of Christ. All is well with me. I'm the righteousness of Christ. God made me righteous. It's not about my works. I didn't do anything to cause me to be righteous, but it's what Jesus did. Amen. It's not about works because sometimes we get so caught up in what we got to do. Lord, I got to go to church. I got to go serve. I got to go do this because I want what? I want to become righteous. I, I want you to bless me. You're already blessed. He's already provided it for us. All is well with us tonight. Amen. All is well. From the message version of this same part of the Bible, I'm going to read it. says, we call Abraham father not because he got God's attention by living like a saint, but because God made something out of Abraham when he was a nobody. 
Isn't that what we're always reading in the scripture? God saying to Abraham, I set you up as the father of many people. Abraham was named father and then became a father because he dared to trust God to do only what God could do. Raise the dead to life with the word, make something out of nothing. When everything was hopeless, Abraham believed anyway. Glory to God. Deciding to live not on the basis of what he saw he couldn't do, but on what God said he would do. So it's not about you. It's not about your, your mind, your, your abilities. It's what God says. And many times when we're preparing lessons like this, you know, I have to say, God, what is it? This has to be about you. It can't be about me. Because the, our main goal is that the people of God hear you and that you give them a word in due season that changes their life, that will cause their belief to change. Now, I submit to you that the more we hear this teaching about getting to know God, about our righteousness, we're uprooting stuff that was put in our minds, that's been put in our minds for years because of wrong teachings. And it takes time for all that stuff to become uprooted. But if you just stay with it, I'm the righteousness. You know, I remember, I remember reading the scripture that when God, when Jesus went to the cross, he paid the price once and for all. And I couldn't understand how can he do that? How can he, how can he die for people that had not even been, been alive yet? How can he take care of their sins? And I began, a thought came, a, a vision came into my mind. And I said, well, Lord, I, I, it's in your word, so it's got to be true. But I saw this. I said, how is it possible then? This has to be true because every time a sinner becomes a believer, Jesus doesn't go back to the cross to die for them. Because otherwise, he'll never get off the cross. I mean, can you visit? I, I visually saw the picture of how that looked. Oh, oh, Dwayne got saved today. Jesus got to go to the cross. Did he get off the cross? Oh, Jesus got, Jesus got to go to the cross. So Jesus got saved. Oh, so the devil got, he going back to the cross again. Can you believe him having to constantly go to the cross every time somebody gives their life to him? That wouldn't make sense. But the Bible says he did it once and for all times. So for those that was come, that's coming after us, their sins have been taken care of as well. But in our finite mind, in our minds trying to comprehend that, we go, are quick to say, well, that just can't be. But I go back to what the scripture says. Either we believe this word of God or we don't. I like the way Dr. Dollar said her, used to say it. He said, listen, I believe the concordance back to the maps. That's how much we've got to believe what this word of God says. Because if we can find the promise in here, then we have a right to believe that and to accept that and say, God, I stand on what your word says. Amen. Now, let's go on. Because some other scriptures that I found out, you know, of people who've been standing with the word of God concerning them. I remember the woman, we, we, for me, a scripture with the woman with the issue of blood. For 12 years, she dealt with that issue. In Mark chapter 5, verse 25 to 29. 12 long years, she dealt with that issue. The Bible says she went to many doctors and nobody could help her. Can you imagine 12 years going to a doctor out of all the tests that they ran or they may run on you, all the poking that they do with the needles and everything that they have you to go through and you still not getting any better? But the Bible says that she heard a report that was circulating about Jesus. After 12 years of dealing with this, you would think that she would have said, well, listen, I done dealt with it for 12 years. I, I, this is the way it's going to be. But she still hoped. There was still there, a belief that was there because why? She heard about a man that was passing through. And she says, 
I'm going to set my belief that if I could just touch the hem of his garment, she says, I know I will be made whole. Now, she could have easily said, oh, you know what? I see all those people around him. I'm not going to be able to get to him. But no, the Bible says that she pressed through the crowd because she didn't need him to touch her. Her faith was set to say, if I could just touch this him. And when she did, the Bible says virtue left out of his body and he turned around and said, who touched me? Daughter, your situation has been made whole again. You're all right. Because why? She trusted him. She trusted God. So I submit to you today, no matter what it looks like, no matter what the, 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 what the doctors may say, no matter what your bank account may say, no matter what your job may say, no matter what your body may say, the word of God says, all is well with us. And I choose to stand on the word of God. You know, I remember the time that when I first started going to the gym, Dwayne knows about this. And, you know, I know I need to lose some weight. But it's, it's not enough for me to go to the gym and stand outside the window and look through at the machines. <laughs> I could stand there and say, oh, I wish I could go up in there. And, and I can, oh, I can get on that machine right there, and that'll help me, and I can do that machine. I can do that exercise right there. See, it's not going to help me if I don't go inside to do what's necessary. Some people choose to stand outside and just look through the window. Yeah, I know that's what the Word of God says, but I just, I just don't know because, see, my mind tells me, no, it's not about your mind, but it's all about what God says. So back to me, I had to decide. Open the door, go inside to the gym, get on the treadmill, pull the weights, do what was necessary to begin to lose the weight that I need to lose. It was a mind. I had to believe this is what I needed to do. And when I began to do what was necessary, things began to change. Why? But I had to set my mind to know I got to do this. This was right for me. Let's move on. Another scripture, Baba talks about the Shudamite woman. Y'all know I love this scripture about the Shudamite woman in 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 20 and 23. You can make notate of that. The Baba says that the Shudamite woman, the, the prophet told us she was going to have a son and she bore the son and her son was out in the field with, her, with his dad and he got sick and they sent him back to the house. And the Bible records that he later died in his mama's arms. And naturally, you would think that she would have been upset because the prophet told me I was going to have a son and now he's going to die. But the Bible says she chose to take him back to the place, up to the room, the room that she had prepared for the prophet, lay him on the prophet's bed and go find the prophet. And the Bible recalls that her husband says, what's going on? Where are you going? She says, all is well. All is well. Now, she was dealing with a dead situation, but she chose not to let that dead situation consume her thoughts, her belief. Her belief was the man of God told me I was going to have a son, so I got to go to him because he's got to raise my son up. The Bible says she went along and, and she found him and she told him what happened, and he, the, the, the prophet came back to the house and raised her son up from the dead. What if her belief would have said, well, that's it. He's gone. And let her emotions take the best of her and just not believe what the word of God, what the prophet had told her. Where would she be right now? All is well with us. All is well with us. We have to learn to take dead situations and turn them around and don't set ourselves in agreement with it. There's another scripture where, where God, where the man, uh, his daughter died and, and she, with Jairus went to go get him, get, the, get Jesus and bring him back to the house. And, and God, Jesus heard them talking about saying, hey, don't go there because she's already dead. And, the, and Jairus was hearing that and Jesus said, don't listen to what they're saying. Just believe. What was he saying? Don't be moved by what they're saying. Trust me. We got this. 
And the Bible said Jesus went back to the house. And they be, he began to say, Jesus said, he, the, she's just sleep. And they laughed. And then the Bible made a, a very profound statement. He said he put them out. Why? Unbelief doesn't need to be around you. Not when you're standing for a serious situation. You don't need any, any doubt and unbelief around you. Not when you're saying, Lord, I trust you. But you got other people saying, you, don't, you trust God and all this is going on in your life right now? No, I trust you. God, your grace is already provided. Your mercy is already, we wake up to new mercies every day. Every day there's a new set of mercies. Last story that I'm going to give you is in Mark chapter 10, verse 46, blind Bartimaeus. The Bible says he was sitting on the side of the road and he heard Jesus was going to be passing by and he began to, to holler out, Lord, have mercy on me. And they were like, man, just be quiet. Just, just lower your voice. No, he, he refused to give up with what he was believing for. Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. He began to cry out the louder. Sometimes we have to say, Lord, I believe you. Because our minds sometimes will try to play tricks on us. That's how what the enemy does. He attacks us with thoughts. And we don't take, if we don't take those thoughts, we don't, he doesn't know that we've received them unless we say it out of our mouths. It matters what you say. It matters what you say. Proverbs 18, 21. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. Proverbs 18, 21. Y'all want to put that up? Proverbs 18, 21. Death and life is in the power of the tongue. And they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. So we choose to speak life to our situations. Not death. I will never set myself in agreement with something that's going wrong in my life. I'll never. Well, no, you're right. We don't have the money to do that. We ain't going to never make it out of this situation. You'll never hear me say that. Because why? I don't believe that. God says, I've already provided everything that you need. The answer that we need is already on the inside of us. It's called the Holy Spirit. And if the more that I get to know the Holy Spirit and commune with him, he talks and give me wisdom and give me plans. Now move here. Now go do this. Now no, no, don't do that, but do that. And we can see ourselves come out of situations if we just listen. I have found that many times, especially today in traffic, I was riding on the beltway and there was one lane that I was in. It was, the traffic was just like slow, not barely moving. But I saw that the lane right next to me, all, all the cars seemed to be moving on. I'm like, well, I need to move over because they, they're moving on. And I got this witness, don't move over. And I'm like, but I see the cars going by. I'm looking, I see this car going by. But I still felt like, don't move over. And I said, okay, well, I'm going to stay here, but we're just sitting here. I mean, I'm, I'm just sitting here. And it wasn't even, not even two minutes that my lane of traffic began to move on and I began to pass up everybody that had passed me up earlier. And I'm like, Father, I thank you because if I just followed my mind, my way of thinking, getting out of the way because I feel like that's the right thing to do. I would have now been stuck in more traffic because now they're stuck. It was an accident in their lane just because you can't see all the way down the, 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 down the road doesn't mean that it's the right thing to do. Amen. Follow what God tells you to do. I'm learning so much in, in, by driving, when I'm driving nowadays about what, how God leads me. Don't do this. Okay, God. So I'm learning. And sometimes I want to say, eh, but it looks good on that side, Lord. Okay. Okay, but Lord, now you know. And then if it's slow traffic, I'm like, well, Lord, there's a reason why this is slow. You, you're trying to keep me from something. So I'm just going to be patient. Amen. I'm having to work on my patience because God, you know better. And I found that when I listen to him and I'm patient, I found out the reason why I was stuck in that particular situation. Trusting God. Changing our belief system. Getting, uncluttering all the old stuff that I used to remember, stuff that I've taught myself, because I was one of those who was sincere about what I was teaching. But I found out that I was sincerely wrong. And when you get new revelation and you learn it, you got to change. I can't say, well, you know what? 
uh-uh, no, that's what I've been teaching. Uh, that's what I, I'm going to stay with that. I, I, I don't care what goes on, but guess what? What am I going to get out of it? I'm not going to see the blessings of God out of the situation. Why? Because I'm teaching law. I taught people, I told people, but if you don't give the tithe, you're cursed. You're cursed with a curse if you don't give your tithe. What was I doing? Making them feel guilty because we still didn't give the tithe. Making them afraid because God going to get them because if you don't give it, he's going to take something from you. When you learn and you do better, you can see the hand of God working in your life. You know, I don't know what, you, what you're going through here tonight. And I know some of the things that I talked about tonight, you know, you've heard this over and over again. Because, but I've learned that the more that I hear it over and over and over again, I uproot all the stuff that I've been thinking and had in my mind. And sometimes those thoughts will still pop up. Just at the time you think that it's all over, it's all gone, something happens and an old root try to pop up. It is at that time you've got to attack that root and say, well, no, no, no. That's not what the word of God says. I'm not going back to the law. I'm under grace now. God, I thank you. Yes, I messed up. I did that. I, I shouldn't have said that, but I know that you still love me. I refuse to feel bad. I'm not going to lower my head. I'm not going to say, well, Lord, I can't, I can't pray to you right now because, you know, I know you're going to get me and because and I, I shouldn't have did this. I, you know, I shouldn't have said that. And, you know, come on. Now is the time to walk in the love and the freedom that we have because of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now that I know what Christ really did for me, I love him even more. Amen. Even more. Yes. We have to learn and we have to go out and teach other people because there are so many people still trapped under the law uh -huh. and, and, and settled with, with staying right where they are. Three things God wants from us as a believer. Number one, he wants us to believe. Number two, he wants us to receive it. And number three, he wants us to say thank you. Three things God wants us to do as a believer. He wants us to, re to believe it. Father, I believe your word. I believe your promise that, all, that, that you provide everything that I need. Then he wants us to receive it, not just talk about it, but I receive it, Lord. I receive it. I receive all my necessary finances. I receive healing in my body. I receive my new job. I receive my new home. I receive the wisdom that I need for this, this situation. And then number three, he wants us to thank him. Father, I thank you. You've given it to me and I receive it right now in Jesus' name. So we got to believe it, receive it, and say thank you. Don't forget to say thank you. Don't forget to let the one to know who provided all that. Don't think that it was because of what you did. Let us not forget. Last scripture, just make note of that. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9. The Bible says, there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that enter into this rest, he shall also cease from his own works as God did from his. Let us Labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. Lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. What are we laboring to do? Laboring to rest. So that's the only labor we're supposed to do is to labor to rest. Now, laboring to rest doesn't mean we're sitting still. That's not what we're talking about. But we're laboring to rest just to, to relax and say, God got this. We have to decide. That if in the laboring part, that listen, are you, when you're dealing with the situation, are you stressing or are you resting? That's what I wanted to say. You have to decide whether you're stressing or whether you're resting. That's a part of going back to the scripture when I read it and really checking myself. Do I really believe what I'm, what I'm hearing right now? Do I really believe what I'm saying right now? Because if you're stressing, you're not believing. When you're not resting, you cause your body to react to that. God wants us to be on the right track when it comes to our, our believing in what his word says. 
we want, I want God's best for you. I don't want people to be dealing with situations and wondering when God's going to come through. No, he comes through for us because we've accepted his word. I don't know how long it may take, but listen, the one with the issue of blood dealt with her issue for 12 years before she got her answer. I once heard somebody say, if you're willing to wait a long time, you won't have to wait long. Because if when you get into this word and you settle it to be a fact in your life, and you're not moved by what popular opinions are, you're not moved by what somebody else says, you're not moved by none of that. You're only moved by what God says. You watch God move in your life. Watch and see what happens in your life. You're going to be amazed at this time next year where you've come from. Because why? God is constantly working with us and giving us new revelation. And we're constantly changing. We're, like Pastor Archer said, we're in a process. We're in a process. It's okay to be in the process. I always say, you know, when you know that, that you're doing something wrong, you don't continue to do it wrong. You realize it, and then you begin to make the change. Because some people say, well, you know, this is the way I am. No, that just means they want to stay like that. They're not interested in doing what God's word says that they should be doing. So tonight, when you leave here, when you're reading scriptures, when you're talking to God, and he's giving you wisdom, I want you to now wonder, to think about, do I really believe what I'm hearing? Am I accepting to be fact what God's word says? If this is a promise for me, I have a right to believe it. But we got to make sure that we're believing the correct stuff. Incorrect believing will have you back into the law. You've got to believe the right thing. Amen? Amen. I hope you were blessed with this word tonight. Amen. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word. I declare, Lord God, that your people will hear you behind this. And I thank you, Lord God, that our words and our lives will never be the same again. We give you honor. We give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, now is our time of giving. So if you're here tonight and you would like to give, we have our way of giving by text. They're going to put up on the screen where you'll be able to give that way. Of course, you know, we do not um, give to get, but we give because God has blessed us. Uh, to give, to be able to do it. So we honor him with it. We love him. We let him direct us in our giving. We're not giving because we're trying to make him to move God's hand. He's already moved. He's already done everything he's going to do. So tonight we believe that. And we believe God's word tonight. Amen. We serve a good and awesome God tonight. Amen. He's so good. He's so good. God, I thank you for your word. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for our giving tonight. We thank you, Lord God, that we sow our seeds into good ground. And we thank you, Lord God, that we're blessed. You've blessed us to be able to give. You provide our seeds in the name of Jesus. We thank you for promotions. We thank you, Lord God, that we're debt free. All bills are paid in Jesus' name. We always have more than enough. We give when you tell us to give. We give how much you tell us to give, Father. In the name of Jesus, we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Tonight, we want to make three simple appeals before we go. First appeal is for salvation. If you're here tonight, you never made Jesus Lord of your life. This is the time that you should make him the Lord of your life so you can have all that God has provided for all believers. Second appeal is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. If you're here tonight, you've never, that you've made him Lord of your life, but you've never received him as, as the filling of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. God wants to speak to you tonight. He wants to give you a heavenly prayer language that you can communicate to him and that he can commune with you. Third and final appeal is concerning membership. If you're here tonight and you would like to become a member of the World Changers Church, our pastors, Pastor Archie and Pastor Melissa, would love to be your pastors to teach you the things of God in a simplistic way. So if you're here tonight and you want to make uh, this place as part of your, the, your church home, we would love to have you. But I think we all are members tonight. I think everybody's good tonight. So let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise for that. Amen. Amen.
Well, let's pray. We'll be dismissed for tonight. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you now for your word. We thank you, Lord God, that as we leave this place, we will never leave your presence. Traveling grace is ours as we go. In Jesus' name, amen. Tell somebody you love Jesus. <laughs>